today's talk, we are really going to talk a lot about bionic body parts. We're going to talk about the kind of deployments of artificial intelligence and machine learning that are tightly and intimately connect connected to the human body. Often we think about things like um, ChatGPT or Gemini or uh, Dolly or any of these other interfaces where it's us interacting with, with a chatbot or an interface window. Um, the kind of view of human agent interaction we'll look at today is really a more tightly coupled one where the, the machine and the person work together in a much more moment by moment basis. Um, so I'm going to start with this slide. This slide, I think, is very motivating because this slide represents darkness. Um, it's something that that human civilization has known for all, all of recorded time. Uh, it is the phenomena where there is a world around us that we can't fully interact with. We know it's there, but our perceptual abilities, our cognitive abilities, and our ability to act on it is limited because we can't reach out into it in ways that allow us to interact with all of those things around us, whether this is the, the depth of, of, of deep space, the deep of the ocean, or simply us walking around at night trying to get find our way to the mailbox. Um, darkness is a, a nice analogy for how humans have to go out and seek to use all of our abilities to preserve all the all of our goals and all of our motivations in the world. Um, and so uh, when I was looking at something that has sort of helped to think about how we have interacted with the darkness of the past, I came on this very faint, famous painting. Uh, okay, so no, it's not modern social media. It is in fact, The Blind Leading the Blind, uh, a paper by Peter Rugel the Elder from 1568. Uh, and the reason I selected this particular painting is that I, I, I wanted to showcase the fact that these, usually I start my talk with a picture of a stick. I think Kim knows this. He's seen my talk uh, when I've given that talk before. Um, but one way that we go out and pursue our, our quest in the darkness is by way of assistive technologies. We use the technologies and tools we develop to help us see into the unknown, to be able to act on that unknown and think about it effectively, and our connections to each other as we go out into the darkness. And and far from the, the sticks of someone with a, that might have sight difference using to navigate the world around them, uh, we've done miraculous things in recent years. We've thrown a sophisticated piece of technology into into deep space to allow us to peer into the very the very uh, um, heartbeat of the universe and the farthest corners of the universe. We're now able to 3D print uh, devices that allow us to actually replace damaged eyes or eyes that were missing, uh, the ability to actually create the organs of sight themselves. And so we've come a long way. And uh, this talk really is going to focus on on that particular vector into the unknown. Uh, so the first part of the talk, it's going to be in three parts. Uh, the first part of the talk, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of some of the new kinds of bodies that we've been able to build, the new kind of devices that we are now coupling to the human body, the new skills that that requires individuals to learn, and some of the new challenges that that that, uh, that leads us to face, both technically and also in, uh, societally. Uh, second part of the talk, we're going to go into one concrete example, since I no longer have an interactive activity that I think will run really well in, in virtual space. And then part three, I'm going to give you a overview of some of the really cool stuff that we've been doing right here at the University of Alberta and the Edmonton region on this topic. So that's our three part. I hope that works for you. Um, if not, I can improvise, but I, th I think this should be a fun tour for the day that's that's right on brand for the topics of the course. All right, so new bodies, new skills, new challenges. Um, Coming a long way from those uh, the sticks and things like that that we we saw or, or or the what you might imagine is the the canonical view of a of a neuroprosthesis or a device to augment or extend human abilities. Um, I'm just showing you here a snapshot of the bionic devices that we have in our lab on campus. There's highly highly uh, motorized and sensorized robotic hands and arms and elbows that we we've come a long way. And in part, this progress has been due to changes in the raw technology, the ability to have more advanced actuators, the things that actually move these bionic devices, more advanced sensors, allowing these devices to perceive the world and more advanced computing technology. This is really a step change. I think when, when Angela, you were mentioning the, the technological singularity and when you hear Rich speak, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you'll reflect on the, the, rapid pace of advancement in in the actual computing devices that power systems all around us from the smart plugs in our houses to uh two devices like the ones i'm showing you here which are designed to extend or augment the human ability and, and i think really importantly is that we've now gotten to the place where we can start to build a new kind of tool we can build a kind of a kind of tool or technology that in fact embodies some of the hallmarks of intelligence itself this is something we could never do before and now we're at that point in our, our technological journey as a species um 
Some of the devices, some of these bionic body parts, these, de these devices are in use every single day by people around the world. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video here. Uh, there's no sound, so don't worry if you're not hearing sound, but I'm going to show you. This is a, a video of a gentleman named Piotr. He was the rep for Aether uh, Biomedical, which is a company I bumped into at the Myelectric Control Symposium. This is a, a conference that happens every three years for people to come together from all around the world to talk about the what's what of upper limb bionic body parts and the, the machine learning solutions that control them. So here, Piotr is someone who who does not have a, a four, uh, a, like the lower part of his arm here. And he's using a robotic device, The in this case, the Aether's power hand, or Zeus hand, sorry. And uh, you can see he's using it to grab objects. Uh, he is able to pick up a, a a flexible cardboard cup and then actually crush it when he wants to, but hold it gently when he doesn't want to uh, crush it. He's able to pick up a wine glass and the hand conforms to it. If we kept going, you'll see that he's going to pick up all sorts of small objects. He can put a lot of force on this. He can like lean on the arm. Um, he can pick up Pelican cases. Piotr let me know that he actually works on, on uh, film sets and things. So he carries around heavy, uh, heavy, heavy crew equipment on film sets and uses film, uses cameras and things like that. Uh, on the set. And so this is a hand that he is using to help him do this. And I just want to highlight here that the bi bionic limb technology has come a long way in a very, in a very, well, I guess a long, long time. It's been around for, for a very, for decades and decades, but in the last five years, especially, I think we've seen a real step change in not just the functionality of the devices for people like Piotr, but also the, the way that these devices look, they're no longer the sort of the, the pink, uh, small, like, contrived looking hands. I'm going to say contrived because I think a lot of those hands were trying very hard to look like biological hands, but they turned out to be pink hooks um, or, or metal hooks and cable systems. But now we see hands that are starting to look very technologically advanced and also function in a more advanced way. Um, maybe Rad, uh, Rad or Angela, can you give me a thumbs up just to make sure you can see the videos? Is everything cool? You can see videos? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Everyone's giving me a thumbs up. That's what I see. Um, hands as well. They're coming with like hot swappable back plates. You can get customized, a customized uh, look and feel to the devices people use. They're waterproof. This is James Austin, one of our uh, our graduated students who who now works at a company called Psionic, demonstrating one of their hands, which is three D printed and fully waterproof. They use a lot. Sorry, not fully three D printed, but they use a lot of three D printing in their manufacturing, which is I think a credit to this particular device. And they've made it in such a way that it is very very waterproof. So if James spilled a little beer on it, it probably would not be a problem. Um, devices as well are, are enhancing in both their look and feel. Uh, people are able to select from more and different kinds of bionic body parts and their clinicians can help them select. And the technologies that power it, the machine learning technologies, the battery technologies, all of these things are advancing at an incredibly rapid rate. I was quite surprised when I went to this conference um, last year and saw some of the change, especially in, in the last like 12 to 24 months. Now, there are some folks who will say that this is, in fact, a uh, a prosthetic industry arms race, the arms hand race. Um, this is a great article. If you want to go read these, this article, uh, I would encourage you to, to look it up. It's an IEEE Spectrum by Britt Young. And uh, someone who's born without a limb, uh, she, she has some great things to say about the focus the industry places on the actual hands and arms themselves and what people actually need and, and makes makes some really good points about the kinds of devices that people actually want to live the lives they want to live, as opposed to having a very fancy hand that, that does all the things a normal hand would be. It's possible that people who play basketball or volleyball would like a custom device that is adapted to their ability to play that sport or to go fishing or to play the drums or to specifically customized device that would allow you to swim in a way that you'd like to swim, um, as opposed to trying to work for hands that are very versions of what a logical limb looks like. Uh, so those are things that are currently used. <laughs> there are also some that are coming soon in research and development. I'm going to take you on a tour that, that goes back about a decade, a little over a decade. Um, one I'd like to show, and I know, Kim, you've seen this this uh, video probably every single time I give a lecture in the class, or at least almost every time. This is Jan Sherman, a, a participant with the BrainGate Project. And uh, what I think is really miraculous here is that Jan is someone who can't move her body below her, her neck, um, so she can't move her arms and legs. And here she is using direct brain interfaces. This was back in 2012 um, and earlier, and here she's using... Those two gray boxes are, in fact, direct cortical um, implants. Those are interfaces directly to the surface of her brain. And by controlling the activity of her brain, by thinking she's able to move that robotic arm to feed herself a chocolate bar, to, to peel of heart silly string, you'll see her fist bump a doctor if we kept going on later in this video, and, uh, and doing a series of manual manipulation tasks. So she's actually projecting herself out into the world from her brain by way of this advanced robotic arm. 
Uh, there's other work from Cleveland FES Clinic, the Functional Electrical Stimulation Group there, where using that same technology, here you can see an, a schematic of the, the way that those those neural interfaces are, are connecting directly to the surface of the brain, that instead of trying to control an exterior robotic device, in this case, the, uh, the device is taking signals from the brain and mapping it down into the body that a person can no longer control. For instance, for someone who might have spinal cord injury. And so this is, think of this like creating a secondary or supplementary nervous system, a way that the person's intent, their will intent and their their desires to to interact with the world is channeled by way of machine to to wires that go under their skin and into their nerves and muscles to activate those nerves and muscles such that they can essentially remote control the body they no longer have contact with in a in a direct voluntary way. It's pretty miraculous technology. Um Many of you, I'm sure, will have also seen some of the modern cortical implants. This is just one of the slides I'm showing here from, from Neuralink, but there's a number of companies now that are designing uh, much more advanced electrodes than the ones that were powering those two demonstrations I showed you before. Um, implants that are flexible. Uh, in, the, in the Neuralink case, this is, again, not an endorsement of Neuralink, um, but I do want to showkace what some of the things they've worked on. Uh, a sewing machine that can literally thread... Uh, flexible electrodes into the surface of a brain while missing all of the the important all the important blood vessels and uh, can can perform recording of thousands and thousands of channels in real time from the surface of that of that brain in, in a relatively stable way and i think i believe that their uh, their recent uh, developments have allow wireless connection too so instead of having a usb c plug in the top of the head uh, they can now wirelessly connect to these implants uh, through a through a, a fully resealed skull so it's quite impressive the kind of uh, direct connections we can now have to the nervous system uh, I'd love to also showcase this. This is very new work. It's a paper that just came out um, from Max Ortiz Catalan and and the team uh, that he interacts with. It's really, I think, very, very impressive work here. It is going from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, but it's work on bone anchored prostheses. So here you can see uh, an example of a someone with a lower limb amputation. And what this, what they, they do, Max's team especially is doing is looking at putting um, essentially titanium shunts into those bones and then running wires through those shunts so that they can actually connect a robotic device directly to the muscles and nerves of the human body by way of these osseo integrated implants, these bone anchored implants. Plans. Um, I'll show you the work we're doing. We're, we're actually doing osseo integration work and bone anchored prostheses, prostheses here at the University of Alberta. So later in the talk, I'll show you some of the work that, that we're pursuing and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I really want to show you this one because it's quite new to have these two bones that are both bone anchored and, and also running those connections directly to the muscles and the peripheral nervous system by way of these, these implants. You can see this on the x-ray schematic on the, uh, on the right here. Really cool and very impressive new work. Um, as an example, though, of osteoindrius, this is from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Here's someone using one of these bone anchored prostheses, in this case, in the upper arm. And you can see that that prosthesis is connected directly to the person's skeleton. And they are um, having recordings from the muscles of their residual limb, which is used to drive the control of this particular robotic arm. So the arm is anchored to their bones, signals are being sampled from the muscles on their body, and they are using that to pick up a series of objects and to interact with the world around them by way of this bone anchored prosthesis. Uh, again, this is, uh, I think, pretty pretty exciting and, and revolutionary work. Uh, one person I, I was very inspired by, I saw a talk by by Matthew Ames at, uh, at a recent conference, and uh, this is someone who, uh, due to uh, toxic shock, lost all four of his limbs. And so he has bone anchored prostheses in all four of his limbs. And he has a really amazing journey. He has a book. I, I encourage you to go out and, and look up his story and, and learn a little bit more about, about his, uh, his story and, his, and what he's done over, over the course of his, his journey to, to be able to live the life he wants to live. I, I just say that it's it's quite miraculous, like through through both advanced technology and very straightforward technology, Matthew has done some heroic things, I think, and is now able to independently drive a car and, and live aspects of his life that he wants to live by way of his interactions with all the, the many devices that support him in his daily life. So this is, a, I think, again, a, a large change in the quality of care that people can aspire to, although there's still a, a number of substantial change, challenges for individuals like Matthew if they're, if they're trying, to, trying to get the care they need when they need it and the way they need it.
I'll also say that biotechnology has gone low profile in wireless. I've showed you a lot of pictures of things that involve wires. Um, there are examples, for instance, going back in the Wayback Machine to 2010, uh, but there are implantable recording devices that like, like grains of rice that are implanted in the muscles or around the nerves of the human body that can connect like little mesh networks to each other and broadcast their signals to the skin. So someone doesn't necessarily have to wear something on their body to control their biotechnology, their bionic limbs. And uh, and here's an example I really like. I saw this again uh, just recently. Um, why am I showing you a temporary tattoo? You're probably asking yourself, this is ridiculous. I, what, and now as you start to see, as they start to peel the tattoo, you'll see why I'm showing this to you. Um, because this is in fact, not just a regular temporary tattoo that was applied to the body. Uh, this is an example of epidermal electronic interfaces. This is another really accelerating field wherein electronic devices can be made in flexible, low profile form and directly attached to the skin of the human body, whether in small form factors like the one on the left or whole back sized electrodes put over the top of the of a, uh, the head of someone to be able to record brain signals, record muscle signals, to be able to record signals from the human body to transmit wirelessly off the body and to be able to do another a number of operations you can even integrate um electronic like uh light light sensing and light generating apparatus into these wearable electronics and there's new technologies for for affixing them to the body which ensures good solid contact um electrical and physical to the human body as these devices are being used so in addition to the technology Kimmy, i haven't put these slides in my previous talk so i figured like this is cool you'll get to see something new today too so there's a value add for you i'm not just, uh, showing you things you've already seen in, in the in previous chats. But uh, I think there's a really interesting advance in, in, in material science and the ability to build electronics that are both can be either short-term or long-term attached to the body and be no thicker than a single layer on the skin of the body. And meanwhile, at the University of Tokyo, so um, as, as Kim will know, I don't think... Uh, all uh, right, or Angela, you know my rules, but I have a lab rule, which is the no doc oc rule that you can attach one or two or even three different limbs to your body. But the minute you attach four, it gets a bit dubious. And maybe you shouldn't be in the lab. Well, in Tokyo, <laughs> they have no such concerns. And uh, so these are the, the Rizai arms. I'm going to show you a quick video, just some snippets of a video here. But uh, it's a really cool experiment from the University of Tokyo, as much as I gave them flack for the no doc oc rule, um, where they looked at what it would mean for people to actually have multiple other arms attached to their body, up to six in this case. Um, and the socio-technical factors, the interactions between people and between people and the limbs uh, that they might have if they were to actually affect this. So they have this great video. Again, you can go check out the YouTube links in the in this talk. If you go just download the slides or I think Kim sent them around. Um, but you can see an individual wearing one of the limbs. Um, they have a really cool dance routine that they're actually showing this person interacting with the limb, attaching multiple limbs to her body, having multiple different kinds of arms. As we move on, you'll see that she uh, she has now, I think, a full complement of the limbs. And there we go. That's the full complement of the limbs. She's now interacting and, and moving alongside four other limbs and eventually will begin to interact with someone else. So someone else who's also using one of these limb systems where they might, in fact, begin to swap limbs. One person might hand a limb to the other. Do I get to that? Maybe I can find you that. No, I don't have that one. But where they're actually act taking off an arm and giving one of their arms to another person uh, and just what that might actually mean. So these are the, again, the GZI arms. I, I think that's really cool. You should just have a look at them because it is a very interesting socio-technical and human computer interaction, uh, human computer interaction study that they've pursued with respect to how people might meaningfully interact with these kinds of supernumerary bionic body parts. Quick question okay. about that. Yeah, perfect. I was going to say, this is exactly the time we're going to break and then we can we can have some questions. Yeah, right. So with the extra limbs, don't you need an extra part in the brain to be able to control the extra limbs? Or how does that connect to the uh, motor system? Absolutely. So this, I will say, I, I, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I'm glad you, I'm glad you noted this. Um, this does not solve the multiple multiplexing problem, which is that if you want to gain ability, you have to give up something. So in this case... Uh, the person would either have to use the motion of some of their existing limbs to control this robot limb, or in many cases, they had someone off board who was controlling the limb with the person and working with the person. So you give up some of the control over the limb to someone who is not part of your body. So being able to, to in fact, 
add the ability to control all those different devices is not something solved in this work. I think this work opens up a great venue for exploring that in more detail, but it doesn't solve that multiplexing problem. A lot of the work we do in my lab on campus is very much focused on that, on that, that amplifying part of the story, which is if you had a tail or a set of wings or a drone flying around you or four arms on your back, if, if, if I allowed four arms in my lab, I only allow three, um, then how would you actually control those things without losing something? How do you get a lot for a little? I don't think you can, as I've said before, I don't think you can get um, something for nothing without the thermodynamics police coming and locking you up. But I think you can get a lot for a little. And, and artificial intelligence and machine intelligence is one way to be able to multiply someone's ability to interact with the world through systems like this. So yeah, it's an awesome question. Thank you. That answers it pretty well. Uh, I have another question. So mm -hmm. for a lot of these, you can control it, but do they, are there sensors on it? So if you're picking up something soft, can you tell it's soft? Can you tell you picked up a cactus? Can you tell how hard you can squish something? Yeah, that's an awesome question. We'll, we'll, we'll dwell on that a little bit in part three of the talk, because I want to show you some of the work we've done uh, here at the University of Alberta on rewiring the human nervous system to be able to take in feedback from the artificial limbs and bionic body parts so that you can actually feel the world around you. Um, in, in many of these examples, the sense of uh, the feedback channel is in fact highly underexplored. Uh, Max Ortiz Catalan's work, that uh, the bone-anchored prosthesis work is a little different in that it does in fact... Um, allow a robotic device to talk directly back to the muscles and the nerves. And they've shown some pretty impressive results as well at giving people the ability to, to start to feel the world around them. But many of these, like this one, for the G's arms, for instance, here, I don't believe that there's any like detailed sensory feedback channel. So it is, it is very much uh, one way outside of the person hearing and seeing the, the devices and feeling, feeling the motors rumble on their back. I think that there is a, you, you, you don't get that, that backwards channel. It's highly, my, my usual claim on this is that the feedback channel is highly underexplored, especially when it comes to using more advanced computing technologies to make it possible. Yeah. Great. Because a lot of the time when we interact with the world, we kind of know where things are and how hard to yeah. hold something by the feedback. Right. But yeah. if we don't have that feedback, we can't appropriately handle those situations. Like if you ever, um, um, you know, got your wisdom teeth pulled out, you know, how they numb your face. Yeah. So I couldn't drink by myself that a straw because I didn't know where my mouth was because I couldn't feel it. Yeah. This is true. We, we've done almost a decade of work in this area, actually, on on what the differences are when someone using a neuroprosthesis can and cannot feel what they're interacting with. And we're still doing active work right now on it. Um, it is really quite, quite amazing. Like some people are really good at feeling the whir of the motors and knowing how like the hum of the motors and they can feel the world by way of some of those tells from their prosthetic device. But like we've got great data showing that when someone has the ability to feel what their prosthesis is feeling, even to a first approximation, they start looking at what they're doing, not looking at what they're holding. So they're not sitting there like maintaining their, their visual contact with their cup as they move it from one place to another for fear it's going to slip. They're going to be picking up their cup and then looking where they're going to put it instead of looking at the object. So we, we can see some really dramatic changes in human visual motor behavior when we start to give them back the ability to feel with their prosthetic device. Majority of prosthetic devices are, are relatively limited, um, especially ones currently used in clinical use. But yeah, there's especially when you start to give back the sense of touch it changes people's interactions and changes people's behavior. It's really quite dramatic. Cool. All right. So I'm going to go to this part two of the talk and, uh, and just sort of give you a little bit of a, again, we're going to cut this short because I have an activity here, but uh, um, I think the important bit that like, if we're thinking about all of those examples from before, and both of you have to some degree brought this up in your, in your questions is like, we're forced to ask essentially, what is the thing or the things that connect the person and the machine? Like, what is it that glue together the person, and the machine, such that they can, they can in fact act together such that the human's goals can be respected and the human can, can fully use this technology to interact with the world around them, to believe it's not just believe it's part of them, but to actually be able to extend their abilities by way of the device. Um, and <clears throat> to take, to take the words of DC Engelbart, um, DC Engelbart, Engelbart, by the way, is the person who invented the computer mouse and uh, and had some, I think, some really transformative thinking um, in the 1960s on what it means to to augment our abilities by way of technology. So Engelbart is a, is, a, is one of the one of the three or a handful of scientists who really motivated my and changed my thinking in this particular area. Engelbart put forward his HLAM-T model, which is thinking about 
the tools we use to augment ourselves in terms of um, the artifacts we use, the languages we use, the methods we use, and the training we have in these artifacts, languages, and methods. Um, so this would say, like, what are the artifacts, languages, and methods that that connect a person to the machine that supports them in their life? And what training is required to support them in excelling in the use of those artifacts, languages, and methods? So I, I think Engelbart provides a great lens for us to think on this. And most importantly, can we still engineer those things to connect a person to a machine? And the classical view of connecting a person and a machine is some kind of encoding and decoding problem where we have to so somehow decipher the human intent and then through an engineered channel of communication, pump that to the machine and maybe do it in the reverse as well. Um, can we still actually build that by hand or do we need to think about it differently? And I, I think my cards are on the table. I think we do need to think about this differently because the minute that someone walks out of the door, of a clinic with their prosthetic device, they've already changed. The device is starting to change and the world around them is changing. And so to have devices, bionic devices, bionic limbs that are able to adapt and flexibly change in respect, respect to and response to the needs and desires and unique situation of an individual, um, we no longer can say, oh, whoa, whoa, your limb stopped working exactly as you needed. You have to go back, wait six months, go back to the clinic and have someone turn a knob by three degrees. Uh, this no longer is a, a model that is sustainable as we start thinking of truly advanced bionic technologies that are parts of people's sensory, motor, and cognitive apparatuses. Um, so we do need to think differently. Uh, view one, I was going to do, uh, I'd normally do a little improv game with you at this point, um, but uh, we're not doing audience participation. I will show you how a Ristol bot. Uh, this is a, a device that uh, it's a live demo, so it might just fail. It might not even work at all, um, but uh, I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put this device on here, but this is a, uh, a wrist mounted robotic supernumerary device that I, I built with my six year old and uh, we made it at home. It's all 3D printed. Uh, it, it uses onboard machine learning. I'll show you it's right here. Um, but I'm going to put it on, I'm actually going to put it on my arm so I can show you more, more appropriate. I'm also going to plug it in. I just want to show you that I'm plugging it in because it hasn't been doing anything. It's been powered down and, uh, well, let's see if it even boots up. Fingers crossed. Ah, oh, it booted up. All right. See, lights are on. Okay. I'm going to put this on while I, I continue to tell you about it. It's not particularly comfortable yet. I, I, I must confess. Um, but Ristlebot is one example of something that is, I think, fundamental to the kinds of artificial intelligence, especially that we study here at the University of Alberta, in that this is a is a robotic device I'm wearing on my arm, which is it just started learning. The minute I plugged it in, and I you can I'm just attaching some some little cables here so it stays attached to my body. But the minute I plugged it in, it started learning. This is a one example of a okay, there. See, it's attached to my arm. Now this is the first time on camera. Kim, I got something new for your course yeah, here. Cool. But I'm controlling it now, not with my muscles. I, I've simplified it down so you can actually see exactly what I'm doing. I'm controlling it here with buttons. I'm opening and closing the, the hand of this robot limb. And uh, I could, well, what do I got in my office here? I can pick up. I haven't even thought this through. Let's see, can maybe it can hold a, this. yeah, it can hold a bag of wheat crunch. This is awesome. Do you guys remember wheat crunch? Kim, do you remember this? this stuff's amazing. I had it when I was a kid. It disappeared from the market. Um, and now it's, uh, it's back. And that's kind of amazing because it's a really great snack. Um, anyway, so it's, I think it's made by Saskatchewan company. Uh, so it can pick up a bag of wheat crunch and, uh, you might ask well, like, well, what am I doing with this? I'm going to actually switch over to this side here. So you can see, this is a small view into the brain of the robot living on my wrist. So it is a continually learning machine. It has uh, sensation. It can sense its orientation in the world. It can sense the, essentially the muscle signals coming back from its little robot hand here. It can tell when it is. Um, it can tell when it is squeezing really hard. It knows the load. It can tell the position of its hand, the velocities this hand is moving in. It can see a limited set of signals coming from me as well in my body. And so what's interesting here is that this robotic device that I have on my arm right now is currently performing an act of machine learning. It's performing an act of continual machine learning in that it is learning about two things. Think about this. Uh, do, Red, Angela, do either of you do neuroscience? Any of you have a neuroscience background? I'm in physiology, so I did quite a bit of neuroscience already. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. I know the parts of the brain. Great. Okay, cool. So we are right on track. So the way you can think about this is it, hopefully you're both familiar with the cerebellum, the projection machinery in the cerebellum. You can almost think of this as if you took two Perkin G cells out of the cerebellum, two of the cells that are in the, the essentially the surface or the cerebellar cortex, 
and you made digital copies of them. This is a, a generalized value function. We propose this in the in the paper on the Horde architecture that maybe Rich will tell you about. Um, but it's like taking two cells of the cerebellum and making them digital and embedding them within this robot. So what they do is they take in a diverse set of sensations, sensory motor inputs, and they make a temporally extended forecast, a prediction about another signal. In this case, I hope you can see, I'm gonna move it close to the arm. As I'm opening and closing the hand of this robot, it is doing one of those predictions is how much how much force or load that hand's going to exert. And it's going to show you that by way of the screen turning blue. As I start to move the hand closer and closer to closing, you can see that in the short time that it's been on, it has learned to predict when it's going to be exerting forces with its robotic hand. So it's learned to predict when it's going to be exerting effort to hold something or to grab something. You can see that again by the screen turning blue right there. It turned bright blue. So that was one of the predictions, one of those little per digital Purkinje per cells. Think of this as like a very, very simple digital exocerebellum that I'm wearing on my wrist. The other aspect of this, and, and you'll be like, why are you showing me all these crazy tech, Patrick? I will tell you later on because the, the things I'm showing you now actually underpin what I think are some of the most impressive and important technologies we've built in our lab over the last decade that actually can impact all sorts of assistive and rehabilitation technologies. But I'm showing you with this weird wrist lobster instead. Okay, so... Uh, hopefully, Kate hey, Kim, is the video recording me as well as my slides? It is, right? I think so. Yep. Ah, cool. Well, we'll find out. That's good. We can, we can show this off later. So the other thing it's learning, it's learning about timing. So I'm going to give it a manual cue. I'm going to press both buttons at once. And you'll see the screen turns yellow. There we go. Four, five. I'm going to press the screen again. You can see that its little brain is changing. I'm going to keep pressing the button every, roughly every three to five seconds. And you can start to see the screens will start flashing green. It's starting to learn the timing of these cues that I've been giving it. It's starting to learn when I'm going to press the buttons again. So this is enough. This is not a prediction about its own operations. It's a prediction about me and my behavior and the cues that I am feeding it. This is like a little external piece of my timing machinery. Um, it, it actually operates a lot more like some of the time cells in the deep brain structures, uh, which is where, where its design was motivated. But again, it's, it's formulated more like one of these digital Purkinje cells. So this robotic device is in fact starting to make two different predictions in real time during its ongoing use. I think that's pretty cool. I'm going to take it off right now so we can move on to the next part of the talk. Um, but uh, I I did want to show you Ristlebot because these uh, these very simple these very simple human facing interaction and predictions actually enable a very powerful class of technologies. So that was Ristlebot, and that is as you might guess one way you might start to train your bionic body parts. Um, I'm gonna and so this is sort of the TLDR from this is that you just saw something that's very uncommon in the world of machine learning. It didn't take like six months and $3 billion to train chat GPT 4.2. That was machine learning that happened in like under 30 seconds while you were watching it. I promise there was nothing like it's an Arduino maker 101. There's not much memory on there. There was no brain on that device before I booted it up. Um, Everything it learned, it learned while you were watching it in that span of the last couple of minutes. So that was something very unconventional, I think, in the in the field of machine learning. And that is, it is a device that was learning from its raw sensory motor experience um, and only its raw sensory motor experience during its lifetime, during its, during its ongoing experience, learning from its interactions with me and only about those interactions with me, not, not sort of a priori biased with any kind of training set or large, large corpus of data. Quick cool. Question. Yeah, I was gonna say we're we're at question break time. You're like right, you are like right on the money every time we're uh, we're looking for questions. Please. So, uh, you have to tell it to, like, look at time, right? Like you have to tell it to just look at time and not anything else. Or is it like he picks and chooses what to look at? Uh, like, this, yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, in. The answer, the 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 global answer to that is no, you don't actually have to tell systems like this, which which sort of uh, piece of its state information is going to be really important to it. I think this is something we've seen over and over again as we've worked with more and more advanced uh, bionic systems is that we, in fact, uh, do have systems that are able to understand which parts of their inputs are relevant to making a prediction or a decision, and we don't have to cherry pick it. In this case, I did subsample all of the available state information for it so that it did have things like um, that temporal representation deliberately and specifically put into, into its input set, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to have just that information. And 
we do know that it can very, very readily learn when, it, even when it has distractor signals, it has other things completely unrelated to the target phenomena it's trying to learn. Uh, so yeah, uh, the the big answer is that, oh, totally okay to have much more complex multidimensional inputs, uh, much, mo much more like you would see in some place like the cerebellum where you have those climbing fibers and things and parallel fibers and all of that, that diverse sets of information that are being broadcast to many of those cells on the cerebellar cortex. Um, but in this case, uh, it is very much looking at at a subsample of its total available state information, in part because I wrote the learning code for it in less than an hour <laughs> in the Arduino sketch maker in the IDE. <laughs> so it was a pretty fast job. So I did not give it all of the full learning capacity it could. But I mean, we can run much more advanced uh, network models on it as well, even in that limited memory. Okay. And so in theory, you could make uh, a robot that can pick up the amount of pressure you put on and time as well and it'll learn oh, yeah. what's more relevant based on the variability or how does yeah. that work yeah yeah totally it, it can start to look at it depends there's like we could have an entire like hour and a half long session talking about the state representations that machines use to make predictions and control decisions um, and to build models it's fantastic and fascinating so i like we could talk a lot more about it but and we will a little bit um in this next part i think we'll have we'll have opportunity i can i can try to call that out for you um but uh yeah if you had like oh, well, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if it could learn to predict that as I'm reaching down for a doorknob, only these fingers are going to move. And then after so much time, there's going to be this much pressure exerted on the mo on the tips of the fingertips. Yes, we can have systems that learn those kind of very contextual or time uh, time and space sensitive uh, phenomena. So that that's very much a thing that we can do. Uh, but I mean, we like we as a community, we've got the we've got the technology, we can rebuild it. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's very good. Angela, do you have any questions before we move on or do we want to roll right into some of the cool stuff we're doing here at U of A? Uh, I think you can move on. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. I just want to make sure you both get a chance. I don't want to, don't want to like leave you. If you, and you could also say I'm pondering and I'll come back at the end and that's also cool. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you a few things we're doing here at U of A. And I, I think we've been a world leader. I mean, of course I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Alberta. I, I have, I believe in the U of A and, and all of our institutions here. So I, um, of course I'm going to say we're the best in the world, but I firmly believe it. Like we have been um, at the University of Alberta leading in not just artificial intelligence, but also the way that we pursue advanced assistive and rehabilitation technologies. We're one of the top sites, in my opinion, across the world in, in doing that. And part of that, just one part of that, um, is the Bionic Limbs for Improved Natural Control Laboratory. This is a lab that that I lead alongside uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hebert, the lab's director. And uh, uh, Jacqueline is a clinician, so she works for a very she has worked for a very very long time in uh with uh individuals with upper limb amputation at the Glen Rose Hospital so she's led clinics there uh she's an incredibly skilled biotechnology researcher as well so I'm, I'm really a great a great privilege and pleasure to be able to to work on an ongoing basis with Jacqueline to, to lead this lab our lab is very interdisciplinary it has students in computing science in mechanical engineering we have medical residents. We have people in the rehabilitation sciences program, uh, people in in the medicine department, uh, folks coming from really all across campus in different ways uh, to interact and work together to solve hard problems in assistive and rehabilitation technologies. And we're part of the smart network. Some of you may have heard of the smart network. It's the sensory motor adaptive rehabilitation technology network, which is a, a cross campus organization with many labs all focused on on different advanced rehab technologies. Uh, not surprisingly, we do a lot of work on robot hands. Some of them are very expensive ones that we have, we have uh, procured from external providers. Some of them are in-house devices that we've designed, like the handy hand here, specifically with machine learning in mind. Um, uh, we do a lot of work, not just on fabricating our own devices, but now we've branched into augmented and virtual reality as a way to test out not just the devices we have, but to increase their accessibility training in those devices, much like the that training artifacts, language methods and training from DC Engelbart I mentioned earlier, and, and look at ways to test out devices that we never could fabricate in the real world to see how people might someday engage with such kind of devices. Um, two of them here that I'm just going to call out are... Uh, our, our bento arm and our handy hand. These are developed over a number of years. Uh, and both of these systems are robotic devices that are largely 3D printed. They're additive manufacturing. Uh, they're very inexpensive in 
an order or two magnitudes less expensive than commercial prosthetic devices. And they're currently in use by research labs all around the world, in hospitals all across the globe, and in and select companies uh, internationally also use these as part of the research and development. And what's cool about them, and I'd like to say, is that they are they're devices that were designed specifically with machine learning in mind. Many times we we think about bionic devices or bionic body parts, and we think about how we might start to apply AI methodologies or machine learning methodologies to the devices. These are devices that were built with the idea that they would be leveraging advanced techniques in artificial intelligence, especially continual learning, like the things you saw in Ristolbot. Um, and to quote Dr. Horrible sing along blog. We also do some very strange and interesting things over the years. As I mentioned earlier, we have built the X arm. This is uh, my student, Adam Parker. He's still, uh, he's at the tail end of his PhD now. But one of the first things that Adam and I did together was work on our supernumerary third arm. This was a, a limb that was mounted to the chest that could move around. The person can control it by way of a little joystick in their hand. Um, and it gave feedback to them by way of this sort of fifth element looking uh, sleeve that uh, that Adam designed to give vibrotactile feedback. And part of this was like, uh, right to one of your earlier questions, this was really looking at, well, how do you control a third arm in a functional way while not sacrificing some of your other function? How do we use machine learning to extend the ability of a person to control another arm that is affixed to their body? We also looked in a similar vein, looked at a extendable forearm prosthesis, a go-go gadget wrist. This was a uh, a prosthetic device that could, in fact, on a signal telescope outward and double in length, uh, something that a physiological arm just couldn't do. We also looked at things like prosthetic falcons. We had a, an undergraduate group that built a, a quadcopter that can be controlled with muscle signals from the human body. So instead of a hand, you might have an actual drone that was flying uh, uh, as attached to your body. And recently... I've been doing quite a bit of work and thinking on on very wild and wacky bionic body parts that we could never create. And so I've built a uh, a VR environment to really test this out and see how humans interact with them. If you want, you can go download the code. There's a VR version, the mouse keyboard version of it on my GitHub. And you can even go, there's a mouse keyboard uh, web version of it that you can play using WebGL if you want to just go, go play around. But the idea here is that, again, same kind of idea. A person is working with an assistive technology with many modes or functions. How do we, how do they interact with that device and how can we use um, advanced computing technologies to support them in more in a more streamlined way as they interact with these technologies. Cool. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples now of the way that we have looked at training some of these bionic body parts, especially the devices we built in our lab, some of the easy ways and and some of the ways that were a little bit harder. Um, the first here, I showed you those two little digital Purkinje cells, right? Um, those two, two little like uh, prediction forming units. We've shown first off that much to your question again, Rad, Rad that uh, that we can have those kind of units take in very diverse sets of, of input information and make prediction about all facets of sensory motor streams. So I showed you two little predictions that we're learning in real time on that robot arm. We have, in this case, 18,000 predictions that are being learned in parallel, in real time, um, based on the movement of this advanced robotic arm. So these are predictions about all of the different motors, their temperatures, their velocities, the, the contact forces on all of the, the different fingers. And predictions, not just about that, but about the errors that the system is making in those predictions. We have this cool paper called Prediction Surprise and Predictions of Surprise, where we looked at seeing whether this system could, in fact, predict all elements of its sensory motor stream based on all elements of its sensory motor stream here turned into bits, the actual flashing lights, the, the, the single ones and zeros on the wires flowing to and from it on the network. Uh, and whether not only that, could it learn to be um, surprised? Could it learn to know when its predictions were wrong based on its past experience? And then finally, could it learn to predict when it might be wrong again about some of those forecasts it was making. So this is some really great work by Johannes Gunther and some of the students in my lab. So I, I, uh, I, if you're interested, I encourage you to check that out. It's a really cool paper, but it, it highlighted to us that it's not just one or two predictions that you could make like I showed you on Ristolbot, that in fact, a system could very reasonably be making tens of thousands of predictions in real time as a device was, was operating. And it could both learn those predictions and also provide those predictions to both itself and its user. And so then imagine that we were to, to hand pick five, six, or seven of those, those predictions. We can we showed in something called adaptive switching. This is the master's thesis of my student, Ann Edwards. And it was a really cool body work. I think still think it's one of the, the most important things to come out of our lab. Um, Ann's work showed that if you take some of those predictions that are learned and made in real time about what modes and functions of a device someone is actually trying to use, you can, in fact, optimize the control interface of that device based on what they use and when they use it. 
Think about this like, hey, you're using your phone and it shows you the last five apps you use or the most five frequent apps you use in this particular situation. It's like that, but for a bionic limb. Here we have a gentleman uh, with an upper limb amputation and he's using, you can see we put the switching signal on his right arm. He's switching between the many modes and functions of a robotic device, much like might be done in a conventional clinical process, deployed prosthesis. And here the system is learning predictions, those same predictions that were running on Ristolbot and that, and that robot arm I showed you in the last video, the predictions about when he's going to use a different function and when and in what situation those functions will be deployed. And it's reordering the way he switches in the system based on those modes and functions. And this is applicable, like that video I showed you of Piotr, the gentleman from the Aether company. Um, he's switching through dozens and dozens of different modes or functions. And the system could, in, in principle, be learning what he uses when he uses it. Further in Anne's thesis, she showed that you can also learn when someone's going to switch between modes and functions and have the system switch for them if it's incredibly confident about what they want. Cool thing about this is that if the person doesn't want it, they can just switch back to what the thing they actually wanted. So it defaults to the gold standard behavior when it fails. So this is a really cool, this is the premise I, I put on almost everything we do in our lab is that it should over time get better than the gold standard, but when it fails, it should at worst default back to the gold standard operation for the person using the technology. Um, since that time, we've moved on. So we, we still do work on adaptive switching, but we've also looked at more context sensitive uh, devices. This is work by uh, Heather Williams, a PhD student supervised by Dr. Jacqueline Hebert and I. And Heather is looking at a way to solve what we call the limb position effect. This is a, a effect that when someone's using a prosthesis that's based on the signals from their muscles and they reach up, for instance, th their muscles are activated in very different ways than they were when they were their arm was say down at waist level and the sensors shift in their arm. And so when someone reaches to try to grab something say above their shoulder level, the system is unable to effectively interpret the signals coming from their body. So Heather looked at using recurrent deep neural networks to solve this problem, to allow a system to take in all sorts of information. Again, Ryan, back to your earlier question, like take in information from inertial measurement units, from those muscle signals, and be able to perform smooth multi-joint control um, based on a person's limb signals, no matter where or in what, what context they're using it. And I also just want to note, this is an example of our gaze and movement assessment technology that we developed in the lab as part of a DARPA project. And uh, you can see that we're also looking at, this is Cody from the lab is actually controlling the arm uh, with her muscle signals. And we're showing that like the way that a person's gaze and their movement changes as they interact with devices. That's how we, uh, to Angela, to, to some of your questions, that's how we started to really assess how people's gaze and movement behavior changes when we give them back the sense of touch. So that is, uh, I'll just highlight the difference. The previous uh, situation was a a learning mechanism, much like on Ristolbot that I showed you, which is based on continual learning based on methods from the field of reinforcement learning. It's learning in real time but in a more of an unsupervised way. This, in, this particular approach is based on what you might have heard called supervised learning or learning from labeled examples, where you train the system and then you use the system. Um, and I'll show you one now, which is true reinforcement learning from demonstration. This is a gentleman with, uh, with an upper limb amputation. And here he's actually training a robotic limb using his biological limb that is that does not have an amputation. So this gentleman with limb difference, you can see he's actually trying to show in different situations, what the robot limb should do based on how he's moving his biological limb. And that robotic system, that, that control system is learning based on signals of good or bad. It's learning based on, on reward signals so that ideally when he sends signals from his upper limb, the muscle of the upper limb, it can interpret it in a, context, in a contextually appropriate way to perform the kind of hand open, close and rotation gestures that he is demonstrating with his motion capture glove on his, on his right biological limb. So this is actual reinforcement learning. This is learning through, through signals of good or bad. So a system can learn to try to achieve something which might be very, very hard to program. Uh, I've showed you those specific examples. I'll just say that that the same kind of learning mechanisms we've used, like the adaptive switching method we used for upper limb control, we've also used for exoskeleton control. This is a collaboration with Vivian Mushawar and one of her students. Look at switching between modes and functions of a lower limb exoskeleton. So someone might be able to change their direction of walking, their speed of walking in a much more context specific way. Vivian's lab has also looked at interspinal microstimulation using those same generalized value functions, those same digital Purkinje cells. 
Uh, we've looked at robot limb failure and anomaly detection. We've looked at hazard prediction to humans as they engage in sort of complex time sensitive behaviors. Um, and also machine learned feedback to robotic limbs uh, for, for, for decision making. So this, my, my student Adam Parker is actually just wrapping up a really in-depth study on machine learned feedback. Um, and we've also looked at how those same kind of learned predictions that are learned in real time can be used to coordinate joint synergies between the multiple joints of a robot arm so that a person, again, going back to earlier conversations, can get a lot for a little. Simple inputs from their part can have very elaborate coordinated behaviors as out outputs. I will say as well that uh, we did something back in 2011, which is still quite, I think, quite, quite impressive it was the first time it's ever display demonstrated in the world which is that we showed that a person just using like thumbs up thumbs down like good good bad signals could actually train a myoelectric prosthesis controller to interpret um signals flowing myoelectric signals that, that were sampled from the human body so you could essentially someone could just be like just like you train a puppy like yep yep that's good that's bad you could actually train a myoelectric control system uh, it turns out that was actually quite tricky to do it. It took a lot of time. So I wouldn't recommend this is like the thing you deploy in the clinic, but we showed it was possible. This was, I think, a pretty a breakthrough study back in 2011. Um, and last on the topic, this will go more to Angela, your earlier question, changing the body to change the machine, to change the body. Um, our center here at the University of Alberta, this is work led by Dr. Jacqueline Hebert, along with my colleague, Dr. Ming Chan and others, uh, work to bring Sensory reinnervation and motor reinnervation surgeries here to the to Edmonton and to Canada. This is a process by way uh, started in, in the in Chicago by Todd Kaiken, but of rewiring the nervous system. Plastic surgeons and and uh, skilled medical professionals can actually rewire the nerves that would have gone to the amputated limb and reattach them to existing biological tissue such that when a person thinks about closing the limb they no longer have muscle tissue on their on their existing body will will contract that can be sampled to drive a robotic limbs uh, motion and similarly that and this is what the work that, uh, that Jacqueline led and I think is really impressive that you can get very precise sensory feedback you can rewire the sensory nerves restring them to the skin of a residual limb such that if you touch someone that limb they can feel it in the finger they no longer have or feel you pressing on the thumb that is no longer attached to their body and so that that paper really showed this by, by Jacqueline and colleagues really showed a, a, a very impressive discrete sensory restoration through nerve rewiring. So what have we done with that? Um, this is one example uh, is when targeted motor renovation, this is a gentleman also using some of those continual learning machine learning uh, control methods from adaptive switching is using those rewired muscles to move objects from one side of a, uh, a box to the other. I'm just going to skip ahead to this next video, though. Um, this one is really neat as well. It's someone who's wearing noise-canceling headphones and blindfold who is using both sensory and motor reinnervation and erotic limb. And here the person is saying, okay, I'm closing my hand. I can feel a ball in my hand. I'm squeezing as hard as I can. I'm lifting the ball up. I'm releasing. I feel it dropping from my hand, and now it's gone. They are, in fact, feeling with the hand they no longer have by way of sensations recorded from the robot that are mapped to small tactors that press into the skin in the nerve rewired parts of their upper limb. So they're actually feeling with the hand that they no longer have. And I believe in that paper as well, Jacqueline and Ming and others showed that, that in fact, that there were other kinds of sensations that could be readily recognized as well in the two-point discrimination tasks that allowed the person to feel with, with some fairly good resolution um, what, their, what their lost hand was actually feeling when essentially projected into a robot. And I'll show you as well, we're doing bone anchored prostheses here at the University of Alberta. This is David's story. Uh, Jacqueline, this is this is mostly work by Dr. Jacqueline Hebert um, and colleagues and collaborators, uh, but it's being based out of our, our Blink lab as well. And here's a gentleman named David. And I'm, I'm showing this because the bone anchor prosthesis, and you might think, well, well, this is like, you know, something that's going to be tricky. Here, he's just going to remove that limb from his body, just sort of like a twist off. And now he's got that bone anchored prosthesis. This is a uh, a shunt that is going directly into into the the bone of his, his upper leg. You can see him moving it back and forth. And what he's going to do now is simply loosen up that connector, fit it back into place, connect on, give it a turn. And he is now tightly and robustly coupled to the robotic device that is uh, that allows him to stand and walk. And I'm just going to try and scrub here to, to show you an example of this. This is him walking with his bone anchored process uh, prosthesis after osseointegration surgeries and the ability to be really tightly connected to this device. Um, so this is this is a huge step change and uh, transition from previous socketed devices. And we recently uh, have a grant now to uh, bring the upper limb versions of this, like you saw earlier, to the Edmonton region and pursue advanced AI research on how someone might be able to control a upper limb bone anchored prosthesis uh, with signals coming from their body. 
Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close now, and then we have a bit more time for questions. Uh, and I guess my closing thoughts here is that, folks, uh, you're already becoming bionic. I'm, I'm sorry to all of you if that was if you're like, oh no no, I like the I like the I like the fact that I'm no longer a, a part human part machine hybrid. You're already human machine hybrids. I'm guessing. Um, I don't know. I know. Kim, you like your digital devices. I know you, You, uh, I think, still are very uh, very engaged with your email and probably see it pop up on some of the devices that support you. Um, yep. I think that's probably yes. Take, yep. Uh, Ryan and Angela, are you, uh, do, you, do you have like smartphones or like smartwatches or things like that? Do you use, do you use chat GPT? Are you using technologies to support you in your life? You can give a thumbs up if you like or not. Yeah. So, I mean, me too. Like I have this smartwatch and it tells me how many steps I've done and how many calories. And I try to go out and appease it by taking a walk around the block. Um, like we've already integrated technology into our life and there's really no take backsies. A tooling corporation is an ancient and powerful amplifier of our abilities. It is a way as like people like uh, Ashby would say, um, W. Ross Ashby would say is that like that much like physical power, intellectual power can be amplified. And we're already using the tools around us to do that. We've already integrated them into our daily life. So I don't think we get take backsies on that. Um, and the, the thing that's changed though, is that really intelligence is the main amplifier. The devices we're starting to support ourselves with now, now actually present with those hallmarks of intelligence. This is something that has changed very recently and very, as you probably have all seen, it's changing very, very rapidly in the state of, of, the, of the world today. Intelligence is now that main amplifier that glues us to the technology around us. And almost every single example I showed you, all of those technologies I was showing you in that first section of the talk, all of them are supported in one way or another by machine learning and machine intelligence. It is the glue that holds the person to the machine. And I, I, so I'll, uh, I like to go back to this quote. And it's one of my one of my sort of motivating quotes, again, from the post-cyberneticist of 1960. This is J.C.R. Licklider, another person who really studied the tightly coupled interaction between humans and machines. And, and Licklider says, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly and that the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. And I will say that I think what Licklider imagined in the 1960s is in fact coming true. I think we are in fact seeing new tightly coupled relationships between humans and machines that does think like human brains of the past uh, would not have thought. It's very different from the from the brains of the past and processes data in a way, that combination of humans and machines, in a way that our standard information processors would never have complemented. This is, a, I think, we we are starting to see the tip the tip of the iceberg or the inflection point in 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 what. Like I'd imagine becoming what we now actually think about as our steady state day to day life. Um, and I, I'm going to say that that, in fact, is to go back to that first slide of the darkness. I think that is indeed how we boldly, boldly venture into that darkness. Uh, so, with that, I want to thank you for being here. I hope you got something out of the talk. And I, I believe we've got a couple of minutes for questions as well. Thanks so much. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, uh, yeah, I have one so um for the lot of these um prosthetics do you act actively have to think about using it or does that um machine learning thing kind of help with that yeah that's a really great question i think there's sort of two prongs to the answer um one is one is the sort of physiologically mapped case and one is the non-physiologically mapped case i'll say what i mean by that so in the case of someone using a prosthesis and say trying to control it with the muscles of their of their upper limb, they're flexing muscles of their body that that never were used to open and close the hand of a robotic limb. So there's not like a, a nice tight physiological mapping between what they're moving on their body and what they're controlling. This is true as well if you had like um, EEG cap or something like that. Someone's using using like some of their brain signals to control a robot arm mounted on their wheelchair to drive their wheelchair. Uh, so in these cases, uh, the degree to which I think you could say someone has to think about it explicitly in part goes back to that training. So people who are really skilled at the use of their like myoelectric processes, their processes driven by muscle signals, will be able to essentially have sort of 
made that mapping smooth. So you'll see people get really, really skilled at just naturally reaching out and closing. And it becomes second nature, like a really skilled athlete or someone who's really good at like esports. Maybe do we call those people? I, I know, are you in esports? I'm not sure if we call someone who's amazing at esports an athlete. We probably do. So anyway, athletes, let's just say athletes. Um, but people are really good at uh, at controlling their body to use the tools and technologies around them. Um, so I think people get better and better and better and they have to think less and less and less. But early on during training and for people who are new to using their assistive devices, I think we do see that people have to think a lot more about it. And so this, I think, is true whether or not someone is using a rehabilitation or an assistive technology or whether it's someone like gluing a new technology onto me, like me just learning what the buttons do on my watch. I have to think about it a lot to begin with, but eventually I start to just interpret the like, double tap of my watch on my wrist as I have a calendar announcement coming up or a, a single tap followed by two single taps that maybe my uh, my mom is coming over to hang out with my kid because the cameras outside our house are firing uh, firing different alerts to my watch. So like it becomes very intuitive after training. So that's the non-physiologically mapped case. Um, in the case, I think, and this is actually the value case for some of those nerve rewiring surgeries, is that if you tried to take all of the nerves that would have gone to the amputated limb in the case of someone with a, an upper limb amputation, and you now restring them to existing tissue, like you take the, the muscles that would have opened and closed the hand and restring it to half of the head of the biceps, or maybe string one of the other ones for like the, maybe one of the, like the wrist rotator and you pull it down and put it into one of the pectoral muscles. Um, and you put an electrode on there. Now the person just thinks about close, they, they don't even have to, to take a huge leap. They just make the motion they would have made if they still had their biological limb. And a real signal on their body closes and you can just map that directly to the robot limb, either by way of machine learning or not. And in that case, then, yeah, it is very much a more a more natural mapping. And the person feels like without having to do a lot of extra cognition that they're moving that body part. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting, interesting results in terms of how the human brain is creating predictions about motor outcomes and then propagating back sensory motor input to change those. Daniel War puts forward and reverse copies and and how uh, how prediction really precedes motor control. So I think there's a lot of really neat stuff that's going on there too as well. But when you have that kind of physiologically mapped control and, and same going back for feedback, when the sensations flowing back uh, from the ro robot limb are mapped to actual um, nerves that would have would have been responsible for say the the contact forces on the fingertip when you get that bi-directional physiological congruence um then the forward inverse copies all the predictions in the human brain and the motor outcomes line up really nicely for the person and they i think the evidence shows can be much more natural in their control and they don't have to train as hard or even train at all in some cases to be able just to make that movement without really having to think about what they're doing. Not like some of the brain computer interfaces where you're like, okay, cool. I want to smell toast or I want to think about rotating a cube or maybe I'm going to pretend I'm running. And like, and you have to make these like sort of elaborate sequences of motions in your mind to move the device based on the, the brain signal recording. I think it's much more in line with the usual physiological inputs and outputs. So those are the two cases. And in both cases, I think you can get to the point where a person will be able to interact with their technology without having to really think about it. It becomes sort of intuitive as opposed to an explicit act of cognition. And also then I will say that using machine learning, artificial intelligence technologies to start to streamline that interaction, I think gets us to the point where people can control more complex technologies more quickly with less training because the machine is taking on some of that fine-grained coordination and contextual adaptation that would be handled by, honestly, would be handled by things like the spinal cord, which are in some cases no longer in contact with the with the person's decision-making apparatus. So so it's like, again, it is like kind of putting a cerebellum or parts of the spinal cord or even parts of the cortex inside the device to be able to take on some of that load and thus release, re release the person from some of the cognitive demands that they need to to leverage to do that motion. Sorry, that was a really long answer. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, that's all the questions I have for now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask you to go on a very big tangent here, but... Uh, sure. So, like, autonomic organs that are not voluntary, involuntary organs, are those also considered prosthesis? Like, maybe yeah. like a, a heart, a mechanical heart. 
Yeah, I'm like showing you the slide. I'm even showing you right now. We can see like I'm. I tried to try. I made the slide, so I tried to represent a pacemaker, a cochlear implant, right. uh, pressure ulcer prevention, stimu electrical stimulation devices, bridges on the spinal cord that allowed that that might bridge over top of a damage to the spinal cord, um, deep brain stimulation apparatus, um, peripheral bands like a fitness band, and the person's holding a cell phone just off frame there and wearing a bionic limb. So I think all of those are definitely bionic technologies they are largely prostheses. They're just taking on different functions and it, different communities will determine different pet piece of neurotechnology or biotechnology um, differently, but in the sense that they all take inputs and give outputs in different ways to the human body and that they are um, supplementary technology that extends, augments, or or um, modifies the, the function of the human body. I would say that, yeah, definitely even applying to some of those baseline functions like heart rhythm or hormone production, all those things we do see, um, we do see those as, I see those as prostheses. I will say that that is all part of the, the sort of the internet of things cohort of neurotechnology, which is now the, the superposition, which is where we are currently sitting in our, uh, our technological, socio-technical, um, our standing in, in, the, the progress of our, our species. Uh, the interesting, like, it is interesting to hear what people reflect as whether or not that's a prosthesis or a bionic technology or what is someone with a cochlear implant may or may not reflect on that as a, as a prosthesis or, or how they, how they, how they specify the relationship between that technology and their body is incredibly interesting. And it is very, from a very constructivist point of view, it's very important because that is, that is what that is to them how they interact with it. if they're wearing a prosthesis and they think about the prosthesis as another agent that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis that might be better for them or worse for them than thinking about it as part of their body. And so it's really interesting to ask people how they relate to the technologies, all of the technologies that support them in daily life, whether they say, Oh, you know, my watch tells me I need to go for a watch or, or, or go for a walk or, Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. looks like we're going for a walk now. Like the language people use is really important. I think student, my students like Adam Parker is, is really uh, conducting detailed qualitative work now. And that's, that's been op eye opening for me as well to think about how, uh, how we can better understand human interaction with increasingly intelligent assistive technologies by way of their qualitative constructed perceptions of those devices in their daily life. So, uh, so that is why it's sort of a, a softer answer for my part is that it also is, um, there's a subjective answer, which is very person by person specific. It's neat though. Like I go give talks in schools and like when I was giving a talk on bionic limbs and showing off a prosthetic hand, one little girl's like, I have that kind of technology too. And she had like a, a, a device to manage blood sugar that was like working with her body on a day on a moment by moment basis. And she's like, she felt kind of cool that she had a piece of technology as well. That was, that was like the prosthetic hands I was showing. So people will also draw similarities in different ways and different people will draw those similarities uh, across different axes or different continuums. Okay, well, that's very cool. But what about uh, since you said that you can have the cells from the cerebellum into a computer? How long until mm -hmm. you can make parts of the brain a prosthesis? Do you think? Uh, so there's work. Uh, there's a lot of work. I skipped this slide. I don't think it's in my talk. I think to leave the slide. Um, you know what? Let me go check. I'm going to exit the presentation. See if I if I actually put it in my slide deck or if I if I really if I skip the slide. Oh no, it's totally here. Hey, can you see the slide? Yes. Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So there are people who are looking at replacing actual cortical tissue. So this is work by Teddy Berger and uh, the company, I think it was Kernel, and then they've changed their business model a bit. But they were looking at, in fact, be able to directly replace damaged brain tissue. So in this case, you could imagine like, hey, you had a part of your brain that was really important for turning short term memories into long term memories. Right. Oh, wow. But that part of the brain was damaged, let's say, due to tra traumatic, <coughs> traumatic brain injury. Could you, if you if you were able to monitor the inputs and outputs, train a machine learning model, which was would be able to assume the function of that piece of damaged cortical tissue? Could you actually simulate and like model that brain region to the degree that it would generate the right outputs to the right regions if given the right inputs from the right regions? You could essentially build a little piece of an exocortex that would handle long-term memory consolidation or motor control or whatever it is, or part of the visual cortex if part of the visual cortex was damaged. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of active work. This is the one example that I, I like because it was, it was thinking about this sort of input output matching by way of, uh, by way of uh, a learned model, but learning models and building silicon technology or other technologies 
maybe wetware technologies to be able to replace lost brain regions or to augment or extend those brain regions. That's very much uh, that's very much on on target for a lot of companies. And I think a lot of the folks who are developing more advanced brain input output devices, like some of the ones I mentioned earlier in this talk, are in fact also thinking about that longer game of well, can we can we replace or add regions to the brain? I like an exocerebellum because I think it's it's nice for the day to day interactions with the world, and it's also very concrete to think about. But uh, uh, an exocortex is something that's on a lot of people's minds as well. I think those are both um, not just something that people are excited to consider, but also I think definitely within reach, which is why we all have to work really hard to think about how that can be done responsibly and in a way that is in fact both safe and scalable uh, before we're able to actually do it because <laughs> it's pretty soon. <laughs> no, that makes me feel better about the singularity. Maybe we can make ourselves before, better before the AI take over. Well, this is, I mean, right, this is really it. And that's why I, I like the, the the comment, Angela's comment from the very beginning here as well, which is that like, when I think about this, we, we often think about, oh, well, there's like all these smart machines. Well, the smart machines are for a very long time are going to be us as well. We're going to be sending technology. We always have been. This isn't new. This is a very old thing. Able, that's why I showed that like early painting of people with the stick. Uh, the um, but it is is that we have been extending ourselves with technology and people used to be oh well, when super intelligence is coming i'm like well it already came it'll be here tomorrow and like we're already going to have if you take a, a, any baseline human intelligence level like from the 1950s we're already going to have superhuman intelligence because we're already i can see all around the world in some cases by a cluster of webcams i like i could be watching the the panama bird feeder right now on my on a youtube channel I can extend myself around the world right now ways I couldn't even a hundred years ago. So we're already able to perform feats of sensation, perception, cognition, action that we never could before. So yeah, the smartest thing on the planet tomorrow is going to probably be us. And it'll again be us. And we continually keep coupling ourselves to our machine technologies. So we're still going to be us. And if bad things happen because of AI, it's probably because we're doing bad things by amplifying ourselves using the artificial intelligence. Um, and, and there may be days like Rich will talk about this. I'm sure that there's going to be um, machines that are thinking very differently than humans think that aren't coupled to humans and that might be doing very advanced things along all the different axes of cognition, which exceed human capacity to all those axes. That's interesting. And humans will also be amplifying ourselves at the same time. And the relationship between those different kinds of intelligence is going to be a really important thing for us to think about, study and manage so that it turns out on the upside, not the downside. Thank you. That was a very cool answer. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. This has been a great teaching session. Thank you very much again. And uh, yeah. So yeah. Thank and, you for having me. Yeah. And the timing is is good too. The teaching session ends in four minutes. So that's, that's pretty good. Kim, I want, I want to say to you as well, I think, uh, I'm not sure about my timing, but uh, I think this might mark the 10-year anniversary of me doing teaching sessions in your class. So I think yeah. the first one was, I think, in 2013, I remember it was fall or winter 2013. I think it might have been fall 2013. So this might be this might be around the 10 year anniversary of 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 doing teaching sessions. So thank you for having me back. And it's been a, a real I've learned a lot. It's been a real joy teaching these sessions in your class over over the years. So thanks for having me back again. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Happy 10 years. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>